That's why when you look at people that have served or people that are our seniors, you should reflect on them and look at them and thank them from the bottom of our heart of what they have shown us and they give us every day by the way they live their life. If you look at the background of Mr. Sullivan's picture, you're going to see a lot on the wall. The true person and the true reflection of his life is right in front of us, sitting there looking at us. And uh, as I said, my daughter taught me there's no perfect life. There are just perfect moments. And tonight, Mr. Sullivan, we are blessed to have you here. Okay. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> it, it was, that probably makes a few people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so with no further ado, I would like you to comment real quickly on the passing of your friend, one of our seniors. And we always reflect on these things. And out of respect to him and what he gave, why don't you talk a little bit about Howard? We lost Howard Singer this last, this last Monday. And um, Howard came late to the, to the credit connection. He was a uh, Joe Demick black belt. Uh, Joe Demick and I started out at the Southgate School, which lasted only for a, a very short period of time. Uh, I'll tell you the story briefly. The, the school was set up as an Aikido school, and it was run by a guy, but I, I believe his name was Sharp, Dan Sharp, and he was an Air Force sergeant. And wherever he went, he would set up a school. And then when he left, he would leave his most student, uh, his most advanced student in charge. And then he just kept traveling around the world doing that. Well, he didn't have anybody uh, advanced enough to leave the school with at that time. So he got a hold of Ed Parker and said, do you want to buy my school? And he gave it to him for probably next to nothing. And the rent was probably next to nothing. But even at that, in those days, this was 1959. And in those days, there were no instructors. He didn't have anybody to put at the school. So, I mean, there was, there was Jimmy Ebrow was the first man I saw. And uh, I was duly impressed but then when i went the next time to see and watch a class i asked him could i watch a class he said yeah and i went and i watched no i'm sorry that, that was what i watched jim hebrow when i came to the next time was a sign up and and that's when i saw ed parker for the first time ed parker and i were the same age 27 but not really he was getting ready to turn 28 in a month and i had just turned 27 three or four months well in november this is in february of the next year so anyway we're very close and um Howard was, was well, Joe and I were, were there together at that school, and then when it closed it, which was ine inevitable, uh, we had a drive to Pasadena. I think we probably made the trip a couple of times together, uh, and then we lost Joe. Joe just went off to somebody else, and I have, I've never seen Joe again, except I think at one of the internationals. Uh, so yes, we were, we were you know, mates at the, at the school, but uh, for a very, very short time. And then uh, parted ways because where he went and where I stayed. And Howard Singer started out with Joe and got his black belt with Joe. And Howard, <laughs> God bless him. Um, he, he was a typical, in fact, he got many, many movie roles uh, because of his biker appearance and, uh, and demeanor and appeal and everything. I mean, he had a ponytail halfway down his back he had the Fu Manchu on stage that came all the way down to, to the tip of his chin and then some, which he dyed black because when he started going gray, that was, that was unacceptable. So he, for years he dyed his hair black, which was okay with everybody. And we accepted that. And he had tattoos from his wrist to his shoulders and across his back and down his front. When he was dr dressed in a shirt, you couldn't see it, but when he had his short sleeves and everything on, I mean, we walked into places already and I've seen people kind of look like, like, oh my God, what is this? look what's coming in here. But then the rest of us come in and they, and they go like, well, wait a minute, he's with a bunch of normal people. So I guess he's okay. <laughs> and of course he was. Um, Howard was one hell of a fighter. I mean, he had, has a garage full of trophies from back in the day. He took championships here, there and everywhere. And um, he loved to tell the story about one time when he got a buy and then somebody couldn't continue. And then it came up to somebody who was eliminated and he won first place just, <laughs> just for being there. <laughs> and I think his last match was gonna be against Donnie Williams. And it was like, uh, could I just pass on this? This is when they were mixing weights and everything else, you know, at the same time. And uh, he's gonna have to fight Donnie. And I think Donnie got disqualified on the match before it. So he did have to fight him. 
So he wound up winning first place, and he's got a nice trophy for it. He's uh, that, that, that the fight a match for it. But Howard, Howard was totally honest about stuff like that. He'd tell you, you know, the, 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 he, he said, you know, I can't tell you how many times I fought. He said, I'd, I'd be all, I'd be all windy. He said, I'd go over to the corner, light up a cigarette <laughs> in between matches. And back in the day, you could do that. I did it. We all did it. But Howie, um, he had a patented attack. And it never became popular for some reason. He kept winning with it. I, I, I learned it from him because I'm the biggest thief around. I mean, if you do something, oh, baby, if you do something and I see it and I like it, it's mine. I will steal it from you in a heartbeat. Really? If it's something that really looks, well, Howard did this thing. He was like a locomotive. And what a big man. Although I got to tell you, when I first met him, he was like 5'10". I have never seen anyone in my life diminish like Howard did. When he when he passed, I don't think he was but about five four or five. From really? five ten, that's I mean that's a whole person. Yeah, that was amazing and just ama it, it broke my heart. Just, but it it was also heartening that he was there. He was there till till a week before he died. He missed the week the the, the Tuesday of and died the next Monday, but he was there the week before that. And he and Marion and uh, Laney and I went out for dinner a couple weeks before that. Um, he just he just kept going. But to get back to his patented move, like I said, he was like a a, a locomotive with a thrasher on the front. He'd come in, he'd, he'd, he'd knock your, your lead hand down, and then he'd bat it down again a few more times, and he'd just keep coming in with back fist, rolling over, until he finally just rolled over you. Really? Oh, it's a beautiful, try it sometime. I'm telling you. So and the thing hit. is, he I mean, you're so busy just off. getting the hell out of the way or trying to block everything, and sooner or later you get hit. Mm. But I mean, his control was good, but sooner or later, <laughs> sooner or later you get hit. Well, I've used it back on him. Yeah. And But the thing is, you had to be careful with him because he didn't back up much. I mean, it, I, I, I've done it successfully with him a few times. Let's say that. More, more like a couple of times <laughs> okay. because it was his move. I mean, he, he really, I've, I've done it with other people with, with success with ease, not so with Howard because you come in with that move and you get one, two, and then all of a sudden he's back on you. And when he had the strength and the power, he just rolled over you. So for a couple of times, it would be a sort of a, a, a tie, but then with, with, with the, 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 the strength, the, ter the determination, because that was, that was three quarters of it right there, determination. And he just rolled back in on you. And, and then, of course, he uses his feet very, very effectively as well. So that's, that's Howard. I will, I've got a picture of him up here now. And I say good morning to him every morning. And I'll say, I'll say good night to him every night. And he will never, ever be forgotten as long as I'm here. You know, last night you, uh, during your dinner, um, you comment that Mr. Parker was so impressed with his fighting that he came out of retirement to come back to fight. Why don't you tell what Mr. Parker did? Share that story briefly, if you could. He promoted him. <laughs> he gave him another degree. He made him a fifth degree because uh, Howard had been retired from, from fighting. He, he never retired from New York, but he retired from fighting for, I guess, a good four or five years or more. I don't know. It was quite a while. And I was at the uh, internationals one year and walking around in his uniform, judging and so on. And they had a, um, a senior division. He said, oh, hell, that's, that's great. He said, I'll do that. And he won it. Wow. Let's go to Mr. <laughs> White for a second. Any thoughts on uh, Howard? Please, uh, Mr. White. We had talked briefly, so maybe. Well, just a, a whole lot of good thoughts. Yeah, I've known Howard since uh, the 60s and always just the most respect for him. Just a fine man, never heard him once say anything negative about anybody and would suit up and show up and fight against anybody. So I really uh, had a lot of respect for him and uh, we'll certainly miss him. Absolutely. I have two things I want to share real quick with everybody. I've mentioned this before. I was lucky as the shadow with Trejo. And uh, I said this before, um, I got the best seat in Pasadena because nobody knew who I was. So I got to sit around and watch all these greats walk in. And I saw lots of them. 
So um, Ken Thomas. Ken Thomas was a great photographer. Did a lot of stuff for Mr. Parker, other than Jim Grumwell. And uh, we were, Frankie goes, we got to go over to the Valley. I don't know why. We're going to meet Mr. Parker uh, for something, and then we're going to go out and hang, go back, I guess. And so we were there, and Ken Thomas is the photographer, and Kenny did some work for me on later on uh, when, after I made Black, uh, he came out to shoot some of the shows, and Mr. Parker was there. So we're there, and I'm this lowly little brown belt. <laughs> I use that word cautiously. With Trejo and in walks Ed Parker into this, into the uh, Inside Kung Fu publication, okay, and he wasn't happy, but it his his attitude was fit perfectly for the cover. So he stri he puts on just his gi top, and do you remember this picture, folks? If yeah. you have a copy of that, you'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I was there, distance of maybe five, six feet from him when he was taking that, and he was not happy doing this, uh, this kind of stuff. And after he said, okay, let's go eat. So I said, you know, <laughs> as that was, I was there. I said, I said, my God, I didn't, you know, you, that's the point right now. What we're sharing here are perfect moments in Kempo. Someday a young martial arts that wants to study Kempo will be hearing the words of Chuck Sullivan or Bob White or Jason Farnsworth or Todd Durgan or Shane Price or Jamie Seabrook, all, they're gonna hear everybody here. And that's the important thing. So our goal in this whole uh, ed educational video series is to try to help bring the educational side back up so that it can support the instructor so they can participate and look and reference and say, you know what? Let's elevate ourselves. Let's avoid the negative things that hap happen sometimes in social media and privately. Um, we're better than that. And I know that. We are a Campo community. We have leaders here that can help us with that. So today, this is the weekend. And I'm pleased to say that while I'm pulling out my magazines, I have to say, happy birthday, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, I uh, have you here with me. Uh, look yeah. at that. We have to Did look at your taking up. <laughs> taking it right there in Vic's throat, huh? Yeah. Uh, no fun day. <laughs> See that? Hey, right. Did. That's a badass there, man. And you know. <laughs> oh boy. You all say, "Well, know him." So one of these days. Did I, Paul? Did I ever tell you, or I don't know if I've ever told this on on video at all? The story about Ed Parker and uh, Black Belt Magazine. No, but we're gonna get that. We're gonna get it out of you. Anyway, before we do. I've heard that one. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Oh, Happy God. birthday <laughs> to you. <laughs> Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to Chuck Sullivan. <laughs> Chuck Sullivan. Happy I'm birthday glad I didn't have to sing that. <laughs> there you go. I don't normally yeah. do that, but I did it because you're important to us. And we're grateful that you're here today. And we're so happy that you celebrated 89 years young. So now, tell us the story, Mr. Sullivan. Well, Ed Parker was going back to a, t a tournament, of, I believe it was run by Junery. This was before the internationals, before turn the cir tournament circuit really got going. And uh, Junery was having one in Washington, D.C. So Ed went back there. And um, before he went, he was visiting down at, at uh, Black Bear Magazine. And they, they said, would you mind getting the names of the winners for us so we can publish them? And he said, not at all. He said, as a matter of fact, if you want, I'll write an article. And I said, oh, that would be wonderful, Mr. Parker. So he went back there and he got all the names. He was there as the head referee, judge and referee. And he, he made sure that he got everybody right and everything. And um, he brought it back to, to them and he wrote an article for them and he, he submitted it to them. And the article came out. And <laughs> some nephew of one of the guys that was one of the, the, the chiefs of Black Belt Magazine changed all the winners. <laughs> Not all of them, but I mean, he screwed it up completely. And they, they printed his list, and Ed Parker started getting calls from all over the country. Hey, brother, what are you doing? You know I want that. And Ed is like, what the hell are you talking about? And he went down. He told me. He says, I went down there. And he said, I didn't shave. I put on a shirt and my khakis and his flip-flops. And he said, I want, he, he, he scared him. <laughs> I mean, he really, he almost, I tell you, I think he came out that, that close to losing. He said, I pounded on that. On the counter so hard, he said, I thought it was going to, I thought it was going to disintegrate. And he yelled at him, how dare you? you and my name, my name is on that article. 
Oh, man, I got to tell you. I mean, I'm sitting there going like, I'm scared for God's sake. He ain't talking to me. <laughs> so now, we, and you know, for several years, and I'm talking a number of years, you never saw the word or the name Ed Parker in Black Belt Magazine. They would not mention him. It, it had to be until the uh, the hierarchy changed over and they finally, things, you know, got back to okay and they finally started, started talking about him and the international. There was years they didn't talk about the internationals at all. Anyway, now, they were going to throw a big event. And it was at the Bonaventure, I think it was at the Bonaventure Hotel, where he finally had his tribute. Right. Hey, they rented all this space and, and, and Black Belt Magazine had their whole back cover. I mean, the whole back cover they devoted to, the, to their event. And they threw the event. Well, they screwed up. They made a really bad error. They threw it on a holiday weekend, thinking that everybody's got the time off. They'll all come. Hardly anybody showed up except the vendors. And they're standing there with their fingers. I mean, <laughs> it's like nobody's here. And he said he was asked to give a, a lecture about how to throw a tournament. And he said they had a big blackboard. He said, Sharp, I took that that chalk and I said, M E V E R, excellent, excellent. And he says, I pointed out, I said, never throw out an event on a holiday weekend. <laughs> and he said, the front row was all the black belt organization because they were trying to fill up the hall. He said, there was only 15 people behind him and they had all these seats. He says, they all shrunk to about half their size. Then he said, I went on to give my, my presentation. He says, made me feel good. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. He used to come into the Pasadena school to pick up the mail looking that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, uh, I put that right on the reception counter there. There you go. And just, you know, gave him a big wide berth because <laughs> he usually was in for that. Anyway. <laughs> yeah.